And our subject this morning is adoption, assurance, inheritance. These three great themes are in the four verses that are before us now from verse 15. Adoption, assurance, and inheritance. Well, we have considered verse 13, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Here is a sign, a crucial sign of being a true believer in Christ, of having been genuinely converted, and that is there is a, a battle within you. And through the work of conscience and the Holy Spirit prompting your conscience, you struggle to put to death the deeds of the flesh, of the old nature. For as many, verse 14, as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that 14th verse we saw is not to be taken out of context. And some people do this, and they are rather attracted to the words led by the Spirit, and they assume quite wrongly, because it has nothing to do with the context, they assume quite wrongly that this refers to some special spiritual blessing whereby you know what God wants you to do or you know what is going to happen at any time. You are led by the Spirit. Why, the enemy makes hay with Christians on this. It enables you to feel somehow superior, special, specially blessed, almost clairvoyant. Perish the thought for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. But the meaning is in the preceding verse, and that is that we are led by the Spirit to mortify, to put to death the deeds of the old nature and to please Christ. And we are also prompted to good works, not specific good works necessarily, but to good works to please the Lord. But then the apostle turns, having introduced us to the idea in verse 14 of sons of God, sons of God. He proceeds under inspiration to elaborate on this term. Verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You are not slaves. In having come to Christ, you are not slaves. You were, he hints, you were slaves as pagans. The church in Rome was made up of converted pagans, polytheists, and converted Jews. Well, as far as the pagans were concerned, oh yes, they had been subject all their life to uh, fictitious gods, bad gods, gods they couldn't know gods who didn't love them, gods who were capricious and evil, and that was taught even. And these gods had to be placated by food sacrifices and wealth sacrifices. And in, they had to be pleased to bring you good fortune, but you never knew when they would turn against you or turn on you. So you were enslaved to them and making offerings to them and worshipping them. And yet they didn't love you and they had no promises for you, no future for you. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, slavery, as you had when you were pagans, even as Jews. Because the prevailing misinterpretation of God's order in the Old Testament at that time among the Jews was that the law of God and the ceremonial law of God, all those ceremonies so rich with pictures of grace and mercy and free forgiveness, they were not being taught as to their meaning, but they were being made a chain. You have to meticulously obey. Every last letter of the law was the teaching of the Jewish clergy. And so the people were in bondage to a system of works and they missed the message of grace which the ancient law portrayed. 
And so whether they were pagans or whether they were Jews who had been converted, they had been in slavery to their religious system previously. And also they were fearful. That's what verse 15 says, the spirit of bondage again to fear. But by contrast, remember the apostle has just introduced the term, the sons of God in verse 14. Now in verse 15, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And I'd like us to think about this for a few moments. The spirit of adoption. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 also, and verses 17 and 18, where it's developed at even greater length. But we'll stay here with this 15th verse. The spirit of adoption. Adoption, the Greek word translated adoption, literally means placing as a son. You have received the Spirit of God which places you in the position of a son. The word adoption is not actually a very good word. It's the best word we can use to translate the Greek, but it's not a very good word because a child who is adopted may receive all the love and the care of the new home, but the child is never literally a child of those parents. So the illustration is not really strong enough for what happens to you as a Christian. You are not actually, may I say, merely adopted. You are placed as a son. You're given a new nature, a very real relationship with God. As father, it's more than mere adoption. You are very truly a son. And that is the term. Ye have received the spirit of adoption, but without quibbling on the word, made a son, a waif or stray, spiritually, far from the Lord, now a child, a son, accepted, incorporated into the family included and made suitable, genuinely made a child of God, embraced by God, loved by God, given a new home, a new family, a father, a new name, kept by him in that way, related to your heavenly father, and to your saviour, who is described as your elder brother, related to him with access. That's the greatest thing, access into the presence of God. Listened to by God, spoken to by God, not in your ear, not directly the voice of God in your mind, but through the scriptures, he speaks to you and you hear his voice and you feel the moral demand of the scripture upon you, protected by him, trained by him, and given a great sense of belonging. You belong, you're not here temporarily, you're not a lodger in the family of God's people, you belong. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, an Aramaic word of great uh, tenderness, and intimacy in the addressing of God as Father. So different from paganism, so different from the prevailing religion of the Jews at that time by their misunderstanding of the scriptures. But that's verse 15. And I look on then to verse 16. Adoption is introduced in verse 15 and then assurance in verse 16, and verse 16, as you may well know, has a double assurance. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. So there are two witnesses. Now in ancient times, whether it were a Jewish hearing or a Roman court, you required a minimum of two witnesses to attest to some fact. And this adoption is also a legal matter. 
in Paul's illustration. You are legally adopted by God, and there are witnesses to the adoption. There are two particularly named. Your own spirit witnesses to the fact that you are adopted into God's family, and the Holy Spirit also witnesses, attesting the witness of your own soul or spirit. That's the meaning of verse 16. The Spirit itself, the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our own spirit that we are the children of God. So there are two witnesses. It is a double assurance. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's Galatians 4, verse 6. But before we go to verse 17, you know you are a child of God. Something so profound has happened to you that your own spirit or being or soul tells you so, and you are certain of it. Well, how, does that, how is that? In what sense does my own spirit witness? Well, it witnesses in a number of ways. First of all, even if you should be enveloped in a period of lack of assurance or doubting, there are certain things that your own experience and your own spirit tell you. For instance, you know the message of God, the Bible, is true. You know it instinctively. Something has happened to you. The devil may be able to suggest to your mind some doubts about this or that aspect of Scripture. He is so cunning. But in general, you know that it is true and it makes perfect sense to you. So you believe it. You've become aware. It wasn't always the case. There was a time this book of God was like any book. In fact, it was worse than most modern books with which you were familiar. You didn't understand its language, its complexity. You never grasped its amazingly consistent nature. You never grasped its message and its depth, its profound character. You didn't see that. But something has happened to you. By a work of the Spirit within you, at conversion, you've been given eyes to see. And you know this is true. And you know this alone explains and accounts for the human condition and everything you see around you. And this alone explains the puzzle of yourself, why you are the person you are, why you were a sinner, why you have standards in your conscience, in your mind, and yet you can't keep them. It explains things to you that nothing else can explain, and no scientific field can explain the fallen nature of man. And so, instinctively, you've come to grasp this is the word of God, and that's a witness that God has dealt with you. Fundamentally, you know this message is true. Sometimes you're challenged. How do you know it's true? Somebody will say to you. How can you prove that that Bible of yours is reliable and is true in all that it says? Why, it's too much to explain almost. You feel that it isn't an adequate answer to say, I just know it's true. You've got to do better than that. And so we fumble around and we try to explain to people the remarkable uh, divine nature and characteristics of the Bible. But for ourselves, this answer is sufficient. We know it is God's word and it has a certain claim upon us and it has authority over us. It is instinctual and that is the witness of our spirit. That is one aspect of knowing how God has dealt wonderfully with us. And we see through this world, we never used to, we were taken in by it. We were optimists concerning this world and human nature, but now we see through it and we understand that it's a fallen world and that knowledge 
is part of our self-witness that tells us you've changed. God has dealt with you. You're not the person you were. And we have a profound sense of need. Yes, we believe we found the Lord. We repented of our sin. We believed in Christ alone for salvation. We, we gave ourselves to him. But yes, uh, what's happened now is, that, is, a, is a big change. We cannot easily sin. And we feel very profoundly, always, our need of Christ's forgiveness and our need of him to save us. Even after we're saved, even after we're his, it's something that's printed within us now. It's embossed upon our human constitution. I depend on Christ. I need him. I look for him. And that marks me out as a believer. My own spirit, as it were, by what has happened to me, is telling me I'm born of God. There's a witness within. Sometimes if I should be plunged into doubt, I only have to look at these evidences, these telltale signs, these things that have made me a different person. All my desires and tastes are different now. I already mentioned I have a battle with sin. It used to be my friend, now it's my worst enemy. And you see, there's, there's a change and a testimony of my own being and spirit to my salvation. And I have a particular connection with the children of God. They mean much more to me. I have so much in common with them. Oh yes, even among Christians, there are sometimes difficulties in relationships because of our foolishness and our remaining sin. Sometimes we don't get on with certain people. Sometimes we, we don't find that rapport and we have to pray to the Lord for help and respect them as we should. But nevertheless, we have an understanding with them. We'd rather talk to them in a long conversation. We wouldn't know what to do as we used to with a pure worldling. Somebody who had no love for God, someone who was an atheist or an unbeliever, how can I, apart from witnessing to that person, how can I hold convivial conversation and pleasantry with such a person for an hour? Find enough to talk about, unless we're here on business or something. Dear friends, we have nothing in common. We have such wildly different views of life and tastes and aspirations and desires. But with the people of God, we have a bond. And we have affection. We have an understanding. And when we talk to each other, so much is taken as read. We know we have so much experience of God in common. And so there's a special bond between God's people. And that's where we belong. And we may say we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. And it's true. And that's our own spirit witnessing to the fact that we are born of God and we've discovered how to pray and even if in our foolishness we don't pray as much as we ought and other things take our attention when we should be praying and even though personal discipline and timekeeping may fail we know that prayer is the most important thing in the world to us and salvation is also if some pastor, some older Christian were to say solemnly to us, I don't believe you could possibly be saved. I've been watching you. I've been observing you. I don't see how you bear any of the marks of conversion. That would be the most awful thing that we could possibly hear because our salvation is the most important thing to us. All this is the witness of our own spirits that we are Christ's, that we are adopted, that we're in the family. But then in addition, there is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, the Spirit itself, or himself, we might prefer, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
Well, we've already seen part of this in earlier verses. The Holy Spirit activates the conscience so that we cannot do the things that we would otherwise have done. That's a witness of the Spirit. Don't leave it out. Oh, I hoped you would be saying that the witness of the Spirit is some special voice or some emanation from on high of God's power. No, it starts in the, may we call it the ordinary work of the Spirit, the stirring of conscience, the stirring of our hearts to love and to good works. Sometimes we stop ourselves and we feel greatly urged and concerned to do this or to do that for someone else, some good work. And if we're honest with ourselves, we would say, I would never have thought of that. It is the Lord moving me to do better and to be a believer who is instrumental in his hands and to pursue love and good works, the work of the Spirit. Do you walk with this? Do you know your conscience being aroused and stirred? and your mind being inclined to do good. It is the witness of the Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are born of God. And then sometimes we're stirred with gratitude to God and wonder and a renewed and a deepened dependence upon him. And that's part of the work and the witness of the Spirit or a deep concern for others. The human heart is so selfish and so self-concerned. What will happen to me? What will people think of me? And then the spirit works and we find ourselves thinking of what can I do for them? What will happen to them? What will become of that lost soul? And that's the witness of the Spirit, engaging with our spirit. And then he strengthens our sense of belonging. Not all the time, because the Spirit is also training us to live by faith. And if he strengthened our sense of assurance and certainty and belonging all the time, we wouldn't bother with faith anymore we wouldn't be being trained to trust him. So sometimes we set out on our waking day and assurance isn't there. And that strong and loved feeling of certainty and belonging isn't there. So today you're called to live by faith and to pray with your mind alone and to address the Lord with the same words of love and gratitude and the same pleas and requests, but with faith alone until the Lord witnesses and brings back your assurance and your certainty. Well, just touching briefly on this verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, adds to our sense of belonging that we, are the children of God. And while that isn't a constant blessing, it's a precious blessing. And we thank God for it. And then verse 17, which continues the thought, heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Look at the reasoning, it's so simple, it's so obvious. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs. Well, of course it follows. If I'm now a child of God, I am an heir. I have an inheritance. It's as certain as that. I cannot be lost. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is here. If children, then heirs. The passage doesn't say, if children, then possibly heirs. If you continue, if you stand, if you're really a child, you will, if children, then heirs. God will not reject you or discard you. Heirs, 
of God and joint heirs with Christ. Well, heirs, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We could turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, not the only passage where the apostle is inspired to increase our knowledge of this. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, the down payment, the deposit, the pledge money. So even before we become heirs, there is a kind of token, a pledge. The work of the Holy Spirit is not only to witness to our spirit that we are children of God, but to witness to it, to us, that we're heirs of eternity. Why one day in the eternal glory, we shall see Christ. We shall be in the place of absolute purity and wonder. We shall have joy and peace beyond belief, joy unspeakable and full of glory, the Apostle Peter calls it. It'll be a place of glorious and intimate fellowship, a place of love, a place of worship and adoration. And we shall see the manifestation of the attributes of God in the new creation. These things are beyond human speech. But here's the point. We shall have an earnest by the Holy Spirit, a down payment even now, some glimpse some inkling we can't have these things now but we can have just a tiny foretaste which enables us to look forward to them in personal devotions you can have some sense of closeness to the Lord in answered prayer why even answered prayer in time of great trouble what a relief it is that those waves of relief that go over you when God delivers you and answers your prayer and provides for you in a remarkable way. Even that is a foretaste of heaven. There's nothing to be relieved from in heaven but the relief and the wonder and the gladness that you experience. That is a foretaste of eternal bliss. You have your small tokens you can see it in Christian character. Are there not, even if you're disappointed with yourself, are there not other Christians and you see in them a tremendous work of God and you see patience and kindness and character and you praise God and you admire it and you say, oh Lord, may I be more like others of thy people. Even here we see the just small tokens of what God will do in eternity when he takes away all sin and all iniquity and purifies us and makes us people of virtue and real depth. Oh, dear friends, even on earth, you have the experience of love and affection with loved ones, and it's just a taste of eternity. So you have a glimpse particularly among the people of God in the church. In verse 17, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, he is truly the heir. He is the one who made heaven and earth he is the one who suffered and died for sinners and offered up his perfect righteousness to deserve and earn heaven. It's his heaven. It's his paradise. It's his glory. He is the one who has brought it into being. And we're heirs with him. And with him we enter in to have an inheritance. Even the term inheritance speaks of grace and inheritance is something which is there waiting for you someone else 
has brought it about. You haven't brought it about. Why even being an heir is a picture of grace. I go into an eternity I have not created. I could not possibly deserve. It is all procured for me by Christ. And I'm a joint heir with him. If so be that we suffer with him. The Spirit of God inspires Paul to include this, and I must comment on it. If so be that we suffer with him. That means to say, everyone who is an heir, everyone who is a child, suffers with Christ while in this world. It's bound to be the case. And you can tell a Christian not only because there is that battle against sin going on within the Christian, but because he is a sufferer in some measure. It's not, if so be that perhaps we suffer. Paul isn't only thinking about extreme persecution, which some believers endure. He's talking about a suffering which is a badge, a mark, of every Christian. I have suffered the loss of all things, says the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3. He'd suffered the loss of his position and his status and his acceptance in the Jewish church. He'd suffered that loss in order to come to Christ. You suffer the loss of much when you become a Christian. You may suffer the loss of friendship, even tender love of somebody who is not a believer, who will no longer or will not for long love you on account of your faith. You'll suffer the loss of friends. You'll, you may suffer the loss of your job. Maybe there are many Christians in the near future who may suffer the loss of their jobs, as some already have. As legislation rolls on to legalize wrong, we think of perhaps the time coming when teachers will be forced to sign up to teaching little children about alternative sexual lifestyles and things that they will find utterly abhorrent and they'll find themselves unable to do. We may be that we're heading in the near future into a period when there will be much loss in the professional field and so on. Dear friends, you may already have suffered loss of favor, loss of promotion, loss of advantage. You may have been written off You've certainly lost your self-love, or much of it, or your self-esteem. You've been divested of that. How pleasurable it was to the old nature to feel proud of yourself and to feel applause and acceptance. And you suffered the loss of those things. I can't recount the amount of loss that you may have suffered. People still losing all things for Christ's sake. Do you recoil from that? If you're put in a position where you have to give something up, surrender something, resign something, part with something, because you cannot go on with it or do it as a Christian, will you do it? Will you or won't you? Well, that may indicate whether you're a true believer or not. That's what these words say. If so be that we suffer with him. We're ready to lose things and suffer on his account, whether it's persecution or loss of other things, that we may be also glorified together. Suffer with Christ. Why, even that with is full of meaning. Like Christ, because we're his, we witness to lost souls. We're concerned for souls. And that brings us rejection and suffering. We suffer, unlike Christ, to put sin to death. He had no sin. 
but we suffer with him. It's his work to make us free from sin. We suffer for him, we suffer like him, we suffer with him in the sense that we always have his help. So that's verse 16, verse 17, the second half. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together, which is a reference to the ultimate resurrection body. Some people don't want to suffer anything. There are ministers who don't want to suffer anything. Never put yourself under a ministry where that minister isn't prepared to suffer. What am I referring to? Well, take the prosperity gospel teachers. They don't want to suffer, they want to be rich. They tell you, you can be rich, but they certainly make themselves rich. They aim to live very rich, comfortable, worldly lives at your expense. Don't forget the scripture says, here's one of the ways you know a Christian, if so be that we suffer with him. They don't want to suffer with him. They want this world and its wealth and riches. And there are some ministers who are not pros prosperity gospel teachers, but they still have an exceptionally good living and they still are very rich people and they have properties and income and fame, and they relish it, and they culture it. They're probably not even Christians. Even if they're reformed teachers, be very careful. If so be that we suffer with him. Always place yourself under a ministry that believes in a modest, moderate lifestyle. And like all Christians, going without for Christ's dear sake, and then there are people in the world of Christian scholarship and they take up professorships and posts in uh, unsound institutions, liberal institutions. Why do they do that? Because they don't want to suffer for Christ's sake. They don't want to go to a simple Bible college and teach ministers. They want the reputation of being a professor in an acclaimed institution. Are they even Christians? If so be that we suffer with Christ. No, they want the same fame, status, acceptance, prosperity as you'd get in the world. So they make their career in liberal institutions. That shouldn't impress us, friends. And such people shouldn't impress us. And I go down to verse 18 where the apostle says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What a remarkable expression. I reckon, says the apostle, I calculate. What are you going to calculate, Paul? This is very interesting. The apostle Paul is going to do some calculation. And his calculation amounts to this. For I calculate that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with. It is as though he begins to calculate and he very quickly gives up. If I draw up two lists, a list of the losses that a Christian must suffer and a list of the gains, I very quickly find, he says, that the list of the losses is not worthy to be compared with the list of the gains. It's overwhelmed by the list of the gains. So I give up my calculation. I am certain, in effect, he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, all the losses he's referred to, in verse 17, are not worthy even to be set against or compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Give up anything that stands in the way of you living for Christ as a Christian. It's a temporary loss for an eternal gain. It's an earthly loss 
for a heavenly gain. You can't calculate this. There's no comparison. You're giving up something which is tainted with sin that you may gain eternal perfection. You're giving up something which is hollow and shallow for something which is substantial and immovable and lasting. There's no comparison. I reckon that the sufferings and the losses that a Christian experiences, yes, a temporary loss of respect and maybe friendship and help and status, these things are just not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Even if you were sent to prison, and that may begin to happen, as it has in so many other lands, and even in this land centuries ago. Yes, that loss, loss of liberty, even loss of life is not worthy to so much as be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Oh, Paul, this is a strange way of putting things. Why do you say which shall be revealed in us and not rather, as we would expect, which shall be revealed to us? No, he means what he says the glory which shall be revealed in us. If you're talking about the things we shall lose that will impoverish us, well, let's talk about the things that we shall personally gain, which enrich us. We haven't even begun to speak, says Paul, about our surroundings in eternal glory and the wonders, and the beauty, and the fellowship, but just what happens within us when Christ comes again and we receive our resurrection bodies, and a large measure even before that in heaven if we die before Christ's return. What happens within us? Oh, we become completely pure. We become filled with understanding and depth and love and wonder. Or the things we see and the things we experience. And when we receive our resurrection bodies and we are made like Christ in the body, not like his divine nature, of course, we shall never be God, but we're made as he is, as a person the glory which shall be revealed in us is beyond human language to describe. So these four verses, tremendous verses, verses 15 to 18, about adoption, the riches of adoption, assurance, the double assurance, the assurance within, the confirming assurance given by the Holy Spirit and inheritance for which there's no comparison. These are the four verses before us this morning. May God bless them to us in personal meditation and praise and thanksgiving. <laughs>